Airing on Asheville FM 103.3 LPFM in Asheville, this is The Final Straw Radio, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcasts and podcast emanating out of occupied Chalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices and perspectives from projects and struggles all around the world, and you can find our archives, transcripts, ways to follow us and support us at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org. This week, we're sharing three segments. First up, Josh Davidson from the Certain Days Freedom for Political Prisoners calendar talks about the upcoming book that he co-edited with political prisoner Eric King from AK Press entitled Rattling the Cages, Oral Histories of North American Political Prisoners, containing over 450 pages of firsthand experiences of resisting from within the belly of the beast from across generations and movements in Turtle Island. We also talk about the upcoming Running Down the Walls events happening around the continent to benefit the ABC Federation War Chest. Then we'll be sharing Sean Swain's segment on Guayacli or Geronimo. And finally, you'll be hearing a panel discussion by members of the A Radio Network recorded on Saturday, July 22nd, 2023 at the International Anarchist Gathering in saint emilier Jura, Switzerland, on the history and role of radio and anarchist and anti-authoritarian resistance, mostly in Europe. Josh, welcome back. Um, would you introduce yourself for the audience with your name, preferred pronouns, uh, political identity, and any other projects that you want to mention? Sure. Thanks so much for having me back first. It's a pleasure to be back. My name is Josh. I, he, him pronouns. I'm an abolitionist and an anarchist, I'm, and I'm involved in a few different projects, one of which is a certain day's Freedom for Political Prisoners calendar which is a fundraiser for political prisoners that's released every year. Uh, and also the Children's Art Project, which is with political prisoner Oso Blanco. And we take indigenous artwork from people imprisoned and put it on greeting cards and then sell those and raise money for the Zapatistas. And uh, finally, I also work in communications with the Zen Education Project, which promotes the teaching of radical people's history in classrooms and provides free lessons and resources for educators. Great. And um, you're also the co-editor of a new book coming out from AK Press that's in pre-sale right now called Rattling the Cages uh, that you co-edited with Eric King, not to tell you about yourself. but uh, <laughs> Yes, thanks for throwing that in there. <laughs> and that's what we're going to talk about first. Uh, would you tell listeners a little bit about the book and who the in intended audience is for it? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, it's a book. It's called Rattling the Cages, Oral Histories of North American Political Prisoners. It's released by AK Press. And it's something that political prisoner Eric, uh, Eric King and I have been editing on, uh, editing and working on for the last several years. Um, I interviewed about 40 current or former political prisoners about their lives inside and what they learned and how they survived and maintained their politics. Uh, and this book is the culmination of all of that. As far as the intended audience, I think it's really geared towards two different audiences. One would be committed radicals and, and maybe people who have done time who just want to learn this history and, and you know, and, and understand better the commitments that these people have taken. And I think the, uh, the second intended audience would be younger activists, people who aren't aware of this history or are just getting involved in, in radical actions or even as we saw recently, the recent, uh, you know, RICO defendants down in Atlanta and Cop City, I think that this could be an excellent resource for them for the potential time that they are facing. Yeah. And I think that like, it's, it's, it's interesting to hear the experiences of people who have done time and who have held to like an ethical stance during it. But one of the things that made me want to ask that question was because the framing that a lot of people bring to their answers includes a like here's kind of what to expect here's how to handle yourself here's that like sort of a an experiential guide or a handing down of direct practical wisdom not just i mean which you know stories and experiences of, of historical events is is great and personal like uplifting or tragedy moments but also this sort of like hey so as committed radicals this is a thing that could happen to you, whether because you decide to take an action that you're very public about or because you get railroaded with charges and the court system just shoves you in a, in a cage. Um, yeah. 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 And that was very intentional. Um, you know, there were a lot of questions and I think we might get into this more, more uh, later, but I, you know, I, I wanted to mix the questions a little bit having to do with history and with their experiences, but also with, um, 
you know, with, with what you said, with practical knowledge, with things that will help people in the future that may face similar uh, obstacles. Yeah. So could you, um, well, I guess the, the book is, the book is definitely like the, the epitome of an inside outside collaboration. Um, and on that note, I wonder if you could talk about your co-editor for anyone who doesn't know who Eric is. Well, that's a weirdly phrased thing. Um, uh, <laughs> how he was inspired to start this project and sort of the, the process of working together while Eric's um, been going through all this repression and attempted silencing by the state. Absolutely. So Eric King is a political prisoner. He's an anarchist, a vegan, an anti-racist. He was imprisoned in 2014 following the politically motivated property destruction in Kansas City, Missouri, after the police murder of Michael Brown. He received 10 years in prison, and um, he's due to be released in February 2024, so in about six months. But during his time in prison, it's been kind of the thing of activist nightmares. He's been assaulted by guards and Nazis. He's been kept in the worst possible conditions in solitary confinement for years and years. Um, but he's never lost hope and we've been communicating for years and years now. And he's always been enamored by our elders from liberation movements that came before, you know, from the American Indian movement, from the black Panther party, from anti-racist whites who acted in solidarity with them. And we've always talked about the commitment that political prisoners from those movements have been able to exhibit. Um, and you know, in the midst of mail bans, in the midst of constant communication restrictions and pervasive repression, he's maintained that, um, you know, that interest and that commitment that he sees with former political prisoners. And he's been interested in, um, you know, in making sure that other people are aware of that, or are aware of that commitment and the struggles that these people have gone through. And I think that was really the early in- inspiration for this. Another inspiration was that, you know, Eric and I have have really just kind of built our relationship on reading books and discussing them initially anyway. And one of those books was Say Nothing, which was about the IRA and the troubles. And that, I think reading that book was kind of the early impetus. It showed him that um, <clears throat> I think the importance of oral histories and, and of capturing the experiences and struggles of people who who have been through the worst. Um, and one thing I also wanted to mention, just kind of an uh, you know an, an interesting tidbit related to this, during one of Eric's many mail bans when he wasn't allowed to have any mail except for from his immediate family, um, he suggested that I write to Oso Blanco. This was probably six or seven years ago, and I'd never we'd both always been interested in in him. Oso Blanco is a very interesting political prisoner and an indigenous person. And I started writing to Oso Blanco and we started what I mentioned earlier, the children's art project to highlight the artwork of indigenous prisoners and to support the Zapatista movement down in Chiapas. So, you know, even in our not being able to communicate, Eric's been able to help create different projects that have been, that have benefited different people. Yeah, that's great. I know we've spoken about Oso Blanco on the show before, but um, would you remind folks a little bit about his case and sort of his activity? He shows up in the book, obviously, as as one of the interviewees. But- yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Oso Blanco has been in prison since 1999. He's an indige- indigenous activist, and uh, he's in prison for expropriating money and supplies for the Zapatistas, for robbing banks and giving those funds to the movement down in in southern mexico he's been in prison for about 25 years now and he's still facing another i don't know 40 years in prison and so the struggle to get him out is very strong but he's an amazing person an amazing writer an amazing uh artist he's got two books out three if you include this one that he's (laughs) that he's also included in and you can uh, find out more about him at his website which is i believe it's friosoblanco.org yeah, so can you talk a bit about where Eric's case is at right now? You know, you mentioned that he's scheduled for release in early early of next year, so like six months more. Um, but obviously, he like you've alluded to in, on the in past shows we've talked about, and we've talked with Eric also about the case that he was facing around the assault on a guard charges, an officer, um, and he was being shipped around from facility to facility, and last that I knew, he was being held at um, the, like, 
most most secure nightmare prison in the United States, ADX Florence. Yeah, can you talk about his condition and and where where things are at as far as you know with his release and um, his conditions? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Eric is still being held at the most restrictive prison in the country, Florence Admax. He's scheduled to be released on February 23rd, 2024. We just found out this week that his bond pending appeal was denied by a judge, meaning that while Eric is eligible right now for home confinement or for a halfway house, the judge is denying it, meaning they're just trying to keep him in the strictest, most repressive confinement they can until the last, last possible chance that they can, which... I think, if anything, is just vindictive and and cruel. But that is par for the course during his decade in prison. He's doing okay. You know, he's surviving. I know he's watching a ton of Jeopardy. So when he gets out, he'll be (laughs) extremely knowledgeable. And he's looking forward to promoting this book and to possibly having a related podcast and really just, um, you know, getting involved and, 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 uh, you know, doing all the things he wasn't able to do for the last decade. Yeah, I can't wait for him to get out and for that that stress to be relieved off of him and his family. It's it's incredible. Yeah. And it's it's also yeah, just just with the inside outside part of it, it's awesome how much like I think there's it's really easy for people to forget the agency that people who are like who are behind bars um have and the participation that they can and do um engage with movement and yeah, you know, going back to some of the historical anti-colonial movements in, in Ireland, for instance, uh, as an example, the the continued, or Palestine, like the continued relationship between people inside and outside is really gratifying and illuminating. And for me, it like just sort of goes against, so if, if the purpose of the state's carceral project is to separate, is to break up communities and separate people from their communities, break up movements and take that energy and soul away by refusing that disconnect by engaging people that are behind the bars, um, you know, alongside of people that are on the outside and being there and present, not only to support someone throughout the process, but also to re welcome them back and help them work through the traumas that the state imposed on them. Once their bid is done uh, is really the sign of a, a strong social movement. And I can't imagine us winning any other way. Absolutely. <clears throat> yeah. Beautifully said. And I couldn't agree more. And yeah, actually I was just talking to some friends in Northern Ireland, some former political prisoners, and they're very excited about this book. Uh, and the same with some, some comrades in Palestine. So, you know, it's Eric's hope. It's our hope that, that this book is just the beginning and that it opens doors for people that are repressed to, um, you know, to share their stories and to to raise their voices. Back to rattling the cages. Could you speak about the approach that you all took with the political prisoners and former political prisoners and prisoners of war that you spoke with? You know, which are like some people who went away because they were involved in a political movement, you know, what we call political prisoners, or the terminology of like social prisoners who turned who became politicized while in the inside and also received repression for their organizing um, or speaking out activities. How did you decide who to reach out to and what was your methodology in approaching the subject matter? Like what questions did you ask? Sure. Great questions. Um, So initially the project started with Eric sending me about 30 questions that he thought would be good to ask to, to people that were willing to contribute. Um, I pared that down to about 25, 24, 25 questions. And I put it into three different categories, prison life, politics, and prison dynamics, and looking forward. And each of the interviews is composed of those three sections. And then the interviews were done via Zoom, via letter, phone call, any way that I could really get in touch with with these particular people. There were follow-up questions which I was able to ask, you know, in person on phone calls or Zoom calls, but for people in prison, it entailed a lot of writing back and forth and clarifying certain things. It was a lot of it was a lot of back and forth, you know, to ensure that what people were saying was was accurate and was what they meant, and, and including any edits and things like that. As far as people to reach out to, I, I did cast the net pretty wide. 
we went, you know, I would say probably a little more than half of the people I reached out to responded. There were some key people that passed away in the during the time that this book was made that we were really hoping to capture their experiences and their voices, including uh, including Maroon Schultz, Matulu Shakur, Kathy Boudin, several others. But yeah, we, we really cast the, the net as wide as possible. And I think that we really got a really diverse group of people that were willing to participate. And I'm really proud of the list of contributors that we do have. Yeah, I wanted to ask about about that. The, like, you've got such a such a span of voices from different movements, different demographic experiences uh, from all across the continent, in different types of incarceration too, from provincial uh, or state levels um, to like federal U.S. or Canadian prisons to county jails, U.S. military, and uh, at incarcerated at different times and you can hear little bits and pieces of like the experience from Julio Montekin or or James Kilgore I guess like yeah the experiences of over decades at various points being incarcerated or being incarcerated at different ages coming into the prison systems and different prison systems it really or like different gendered prisons like it, it paints a big picture or trans folks in prison like yeah I it creates a really interesting opportunity to kind of survey how incarceration has changed or differs in these different contexts. And I wonder if you had thoughts on that aspect in particular, or if you've gotten feedback on that. Well, there hasn't been much feedback yet. Uh, The book is still in pre-release and there's only been really a handful of people who have read it. So I'm excited for more people to read it and to, to hear what they do think. You're right though. It's a wide and diverse group of people that I was able to interview some of them went into prison in the early 1970s and weren't released until the last five years or so. Still, Some are still locked up today and were, were imprisoned in the early 70s. I spoke with others who were incarcerated more recently, one who spent a year on Rikers Island. Most of the people I, I interviewed were incarcerated or are incarcerated in the United States, but Anne Hansen is one uh, that it was imprisoned in Canada related to the direct action movement. And I think the juxtaposition of these voices shows the breadth and the depth of our carceral system and and the people that it's willing to go after. I think the book really is a timeline of state repression and abuse, but also of resistance and love and struggle. So, yeah, I'm really proud of the diversity included. And But also, like I said, you know, I think Eric sees this book as the beginning. So hopefully we're able to include more diverse and other voices in, in, in future versions of this book. Yeah. Were there any responses that really surprised you? Like, I, um, I shouldn't be surprised, I guess, but there was like the theme there were like stories about birds showed up in, in at least Rebecca Rubin and Osa Blanco stories. That was really moving. We, you know, birds are one of these animals that's able to get over the fences and show up in, you know, in outside of people's, outside of people's windows or in the yard or whatever. And they also are so symbolic to people, uh, whether spiritually or just in terms of something that's able to, to get above and beyond. Like it's, it's, it's definitely like birds are definitely a huge part of the imagery of surpassing the limits imposed by prisons in our artwork. But so, yeah. And also, yeah. So this direct opportunity to personally interface with nature, despite all the attempts of the guards and the razor wire and everything and, and opportunities to kind of show kindness. I wonder if there's, the, so those are like two examples that sort of just like popped into my head, but I wonder if there are any other like surprising stories that came up, particularly if they were sort of shared by people who were incarcerated in different, in different sorts of situations. Cause I think that sort of shows a lot about the spirit of resistance and liberation that's shared among the voices you provide in the book. Yeah, that's really interesting. And if you'll remember during Eric's uh, assault trial with the BOP. I got the coffee. Yeah, they they claimed that a bird flew into a cell and flooded his cell and knocked over coffee and whatnot. Um, (laughs) But you're right. The the absence of wildlife and natural environments within the prison system, it's intentional. And it's part of the dehumanizing process of our carceral system. And I think when Rebecca Rubin and also Blanco speak of saving birds and, and protecting animals where they are, where, when they're held in prison, you know, it's not only really moving, but it's symbolic of, of their resistance as political prisoners, you know, in the face of the state of repression that they, that they face in prison, that they're willing to put themselves at risk to protect life 
to protect animals, to protect the environment in whatever way they can, which is in stark contrast to our carceral system. In terms of other surprising responses, I'll say that many people I interviewed spoke of joy, spoke of the joy that they found as revolutionaries in continuing to resist the system, even while incarcerated. You know, and it, uh, the carceral system dehumanizes people as much as it possibly can. And the people I interviewed found joy in, in building relationships and promoting revolutionary change in political education and just, and you know, in every chance they got to be human with other people behind prison bars. And I think that really struck me as something important that I wasn't necessarily expecting. So right now we're in a period of pre-sales for the book that's going to benefit the ABC Federation War Chest. And I know we've talked about that project on the show before, but uh, if you could talk a little bit about the ABCF and the war chest, where the money goes. So this book, Rattling the Cages, is a fundraiser for and a way to raise awareness of those in prison for politically motivated actions. As such, proceeds for any book sales are split between the ABC War Chest and Eric. So the ABC War Chest, that's the Anarchist Black Cross War Chest, has been around for several decades now. I believe it's been active in the U.S. since the mid-80s, probably. And they provide a monthly stipend to political prisoners that are currently serving time. So they put money on their books so that they're able to buy things from commissary, uh, help others around them, and, you know, and, and not be in need. So any proceeds from the book will be split between that war chest and Eric so that he has some, hopefully some financial cushion when he is finally released from prison. Uh, but in addition to that, if you buy the book now as a pre-order before September 18th uh, at Burning Books or AK Press, and I'll get those websites uh, <laughs> momentarily, if you buy the book from either of those places as a pre-order, the book is not only 15% off, but $5 from each book sold will be donated to Running Down the Walls, which is the Anarchist Black Cross annual 5K fundraiser uh, happening this year on September 17th at places all across Turtle Island. Cool. And if someone's looking to, well, I know at least for a couple of them, maybe the dates to sign up for participating in the run is up. But for folks that are just hearing about the running down the walls. Could you talk a bit about those events and who can participate and, and how one participates in it? Sure. Uh, and the name is, is a bit ableist. You don't actually have to be able to run. You can push down the walls. You can do whatever you can as long as you're there. Last year I was in Philly and it was a really amazing event. There were hundreds of people, including former political prisoners and things like that. Uh, this year I'll be at the Seattle event, but there's events in New York City, I, Chicago, Portland, Oregon, Seattle, LA, they're all over the place. And there's a website, abcf.net, where you can find specific locations for running down the walls. But it's a really amazing event. You'll find different, you know, reading materials and, and different tabling organizations there. And I can't, can't recommend it enough. Yeah, and it seems like from past events, there's been uh, speakers from Jericho Movement and former political prisoners, and also folks from ABC and from other like uh, prisoner support and anti-repression groups that actually talk. So, I mean, you know, if you're in one of those cities and you're looking to get involved in anti-repression work or meet some movement elders um, or both, then this seems like a really good opportunity for that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Last year, Jihad Abdul Mumit with the Jericho Movement gave a great speech at the Philly uh, running down the walls. This year, I know several members of the George Jackson Brigade are planning to be at the Seattle event. So yeah, hopefully there's a there's a great turnout. And there will be uh, rattling the cages postcards at most of those events. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, would you, I guess, since we've talked, you know, because this is a, an interfacing event that we're talking about, as well as a fundraiser, um, those, the running down the walls, uh, would you care to mark any releases of incarcerated comrades or anyone moving on to their ancestors? You, you named a few earlier, but it'd be nice to kind of make space if, if you want that. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you. Sadly, there have been many political prisoners, current or former, who have passed away just while I've been working on this book, while Eric and I have been working on this book, which has been the last three or four years. They are Russell Maroon Schultz, Bo Brown, 
Romaine Chip Fitzgerald, Thomas Blood McCreary, Kathy Boudin, Albert Woodfox, Marshall Eddie Conway, and Dr. Matulu Shakur. And they are all, we're all amazing people and amazing revolutionaries. The last two, Eddie Conway and Matulu Shakur, were both from Baltimore, which uh, is where I lived for a long time. And I, I got to know Eddie fairly well. And um, yeah, they're, they're all really amazing people. And, and, and they did amazing work during their lives. On a lighter note, in terms of release, Rushal Sinkyu McGee was finally released this summer. He was imprisoned in 1963, which means he spent 60 years in prison. He was Angela Davis's co-defendant following the failed Marin County court kidnapping by Jonathan Jackson. And he, yeah, he's he's been in prison for 60 years, for, for longer than many of us have been alive. So it's amazing to finally see him walk out of this, walk out as a free person. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so at the top of the interview, you mentioned projects that you work with, and one of them was a certain day's calendar, uh, certain day's Freedom for Political Prisoners calendar, full name. Would you mind talking about like where that project is at in its in its yearly cycle, and uh, if there are still chances for people to kick in or or pre order anything like that for that? The twenty twenty four certain days calendar is in production. We are working on it. We are. Unfortunately, a little bit slower, a little bit behind schedule, uh, more so than, than in previous years. But we've got an amazing collection of contributors, both um, artists and, and writers. And we're really looking forward to, to finalizing it and to getting it out into the world as soon as possible. Hopefully, pre-orders will be up in the next week or so. So you can go to Burning Books and order the calendar and the book and get some free shipping. But like I said, we do have an amazing list of contributors, and I'll just name a few of them. Uh, we've got Leonard Peltier, Dr. Tolbert, Tolbert Small, Zane McNeil, Dominique Conway, who is Eddie Conway's partner, Eric King, David Gilbert, Ed Mead, and Obonzo, Josh McPhee, Jessica Sabagal, Zanachli, Ricardo Levens Morales, and so many more. Um, yeah, so we're really looking forward to releasing this, and we hope that it sells well, as it has done in previous years. And for those who pay close attention, uh, you may notice in the text boxes on each month page some quotes from from the Rattling the Cages book. Nice, nice cross posting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah. Was there was there anything else that I didn't ask about that you wanted to, to talk about? No, not really. Thank you for all the great questions. I do have a couple of websites that I can just shout out if people you know yeah, if people please. want to access. Uh, so supporteric.king.org certaindays.org, burningbooks.com, akpress.org, and then for Running Down the Walls, it's abcf.net slash blog slash Running Down the Walls 2023. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Josh. I really appreciate the work that y'all, that you're involved in, as well as uh, making this conversation happen. Absolutely. Thank you, Burst. Thanks for con- continuing to do this. Yeah, my pleasure. <laughs> the Final Straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZN. You're listening to Dissident Island Radio. Live every first and third Friday of the month at 9pm GMT. Check out www.dissidentisland.org for downloads and more. And now some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. Geronimo. Just invoking the name conjures up the image of him. That intense gaze, the scowl, the rifle in his grip. No one, except perhaps Osama bin Laden after September 11th, was more despised, reviled, or hated in the American consciousness. He was the single greatest impediment to U.S. westward expansion the myth of manifest destiny, and so-called peaceful settlement. 
He seemed to be a force of nature, the wrath of angry gods unleashed upon a colonizer who had arrogantly assumed the wars were over. Geronimo. He's the status of Elvis, Madonna, or Cher, recognizable by just one name. But the irony is, his name was actually Goyacla. He came to be known as Geronimo only because the Mexican soldiers he slaughtered would pray loudly to St. Geronimo, and the American witnesses mistakenly believed those dying men to be yelling the name of their killer. So the name Geronimo stuck. Geronimo, Goyacla, was Chiricahua Apache, living in the hills and canyons in what is now southern Arizona, sometimes traveling as far as the Mexico-New Mexican border. By the time the colonizer forces had reached that area of the continent, the so-called Indian Wars were over. Tecumseh and Crazy Horse were long dead. There was nothing left for the invading forces to do but to mop up and consolidate. Historically, it was probably the Mexican forces who went into the village and exterminated everyone, including Guyacla's daughters, his mother, and his wife. Not that it mattered who it was. Had the U.S. Army gotten there first, it would have been their bullets and bayonets leaving the corpses for Guyacla to find. To him, the encroaching forces were all the same. They brought death and called it peace. From that moment forward, for years to follow, Guyacla left a swath of devastation in his wake, declaring total war on all encroaching enemies, both the United States and Mexico. With just a small band of Apache fighters, Goyacla raided and burned towns, then ambushed the military forces that responded, then attacked the underdefended outposts that those forces had left. His fellow Apache fighters and enemies alike assigned supernatural qualities to him. According to accounts, in battle, whenever Goyacla was shot, he would take a knife and dig into the wound and remove the bullet, and then continue fighting. He rode recklessly into gunfire, convinced wholeheartedly that the white men's bullets couldn't kill him. On three occasions at least, he surrendered to U.S. forces, only to recruit more fighters and again escape. This account that follows is written by a federal judge in a case where an American named Moeller W. Scott sought compensation for his lost property that was destroyed in the U.S. war with Cuyacla. <clears throat> the year 1886 witnessed the last Indian War of this country. On the 4th of September of that year, the last war party of the Apache surrendered in the Sierra Madre of Mexico. This surrender closed an active campaign extending over a period of 16 months. The military forces engaged at the time of the surrender consisted, on the part of the United States, of 42 companies of cavalry and infantry on the part of our ally, the Republic of Mexico, of 4,000 men, and on the part of the common enemy, the Apaches, of not more than 50 men and a few women. An unpublished, unprinted contemporaneous report from General Miles to General Howard gives the number of the prisoners as 22 men, 14 women, and 3 children. In our military history, this Indian army will be known as Geronimo and his band. If the narrative of this Indian's exploits had come down to us in tradition from a former age, it is safe to say that scientific criticism would condemn it as a myth, as an instance of the love of the exaggerated and superstitious and impossible which dwells in the unscientific mind. But the costly record of Geronimo is one which never can be questioned. His campaign taxed the powers of two great civilized governments, it involved a treaty which allowed the forces of one to cross the frontier of the other. It received the energy and experience and ability of our two greatest masters of Indian warfare, General Crook and General Miles. The war was waged on the part of the United States at least with the best of military appliances of modern warfare, including steam, electricity, and the heliostat. Our troops were led by Apache scouts. Yet Geronimo armed his band with the best of modern breech loaders and ammunition, and even equipped them with field glasses taken from us, 
and drew his supplies from wherever he would, and inflicted incalculable damage on the country of both of his enemies, and carried on his last campaign successfully for five months. There is not, probably in the history or traditions or myths of the human race, another instance of such prolonged resistance against such tremendous odds. You can read the entire court decision by searching Scott v. U.S., 33 Court of Claims, 486, decided in 1898. After Guyatla's final surrender, he was removed from his homeland in the southwest and sent first to a reservation in Florida and then to Washington, D.C. In the last years of his life, he pleaded to be returned to Chiricahua Territory, but the colonizer government refused. Somewhat anticlimactically, in his old age, he fell from his horse in the rain and caught pneumonia. On his deathbed, he asked to be returned to his home. His last words, he said, I never should have surrendered. I should have fought until I was the last man alive. He was buried at the Apache Prisoner of War graveyard at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. In 1998, descendants of Goyakla attempted to have his remains returned to the Chiricahua Apache under the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, but were denied. As a consequence, even in death, Goyakla remains a captive of his enemy. Even in death, the enemy finds rationales to subvert the law to deprive him of justice. I've never been to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. I don't know how hard it is to get on the base, and I don't know what kind of security they have at their graveyard. But if I were not currently captive myself, I think those are the things I might want to know before taking initiative and engaging in direct action to end an injustice. I think it would be a great honor to accompany Goyakla on his final escape from the U.S. Army to be present for his last act of resistance, to see him finally return home. This is Anarchist Prisoner Sean Swain from the Super Duper Uber Mega Ultra Hyper Turbo Multi Maxi Max in Youngstown, Ohio. If you're listening, you are the resistance. You can still write Sean at his new old new again address at Sean Swain number A24. 3205 OSP Youngstown 878 Coitsville Hubbard Road Youngstown Ohio 44505 You can find his past writings updates on his case hear his past audio find out how to get his books plus ways to contribute to his legal defense fund at seanswain.org If you want to support the Final Straw Radio, you can subscribe to our podcast via various platforms, follow, rate, and share our materials online, and learn more at tfsr.wtf. And if you'd like to fund our transcription work that allows for easier translation, more accessibility of content, and the zines that we produce from each interview, consider picking up some merch from us or making a one-time or recurring donation via PayPal, Venmo, Stripe, or LibrePay, or joining our Patreon to access early release content and other goodies via the links that you can find at tfsr.wtf slash support. And now please get ready for one hour long recording done by Anarchist and Anti-Authoritarian Radio Network on Anarchist Gathering in saint in Swiss, where thousands of anarchists from all around the world were commemorating hundreds in 50 years from establishing of the first anti-authoritarian international. We will hear a roundtable of different radio projects on topic of the role of radios in revolutionary processes. Let's hear what they have to say. So hello, dear people listening. We are like here in saint the big anarchist worldwide gathering um, 2023. Uh, we say hi from the anarchist and anti-authoritarian radio network. You can find us and our content at a-radio-network.org. So check out our amazing anarchist audio content that we all gather together uh, all the time. And yeah, we've come here together to meet privately and have some internal discussions and planning, but also we made some public event for everybody who's interested to join and check out what we're doing and to maybe get started 
um, collaborating with us. And I don't know if you know, but actually since it's 2023 today, it's been a hundred years that the first radio show was aired. Uh, please, comrade, can you give us some more information about the radio history in Europe? Well, I will try my very best since what I have here is some handwritten notes that I took from a presentation by another comrade several months ago and I kind of summed it up into this five-minute presentation I'm going to give you. So I am going to be speaking from a Western European slash German perspective because that's where I'm from and that's the history I know most about, most about. And what we know is that already in 1924, so only one year after the first show was broadcast, um, the first Arbeiter Radio Clubs started forming. So um, groups of workers that were meeting to produce radio shows and also to listen to radio shows together because very easy, very quickly it was found out that um, the technique of the radio, the technology itself, having a transmitter and a receiver is something you can easily build by yourself and use it to, well, not only reach the masses, but also to reach your secret little working class group that you want to share your propaganda with and that you want to share with what you have been going through. Um, and another like interesting history then comes during the Second World War from also that time for me, the first real big symbol of an international um, radio network that is anti-authoritarian um, was when the anti-fascist comrades from Germany went to Spain um, from where on out they were transmitting the so-called Feindsender. So this was like an anti-fascist newsreel um, that was being spread through short waves and reached Germany to like make counter propaganda to change um, yeah to counter the fascist propaganda basically um, and they did this from the parts in Spain that were still fighting against the Franco regime so this is like another very interesting part um, and then the several many different things happen and now I'm going to make a jump in history. Um, towards the autonomous movement that began in the 70s here in Europe. And within the autonomous movement, it was basically a rediscovering of what a great tool for an anti-authoritarian struggle radio can be. So we have um, data that shows that people from the movement between Hamburg, Zurich and Italy were uh, exchanging knowledge about how to build transmitters and how to make radios and how to start pirate radios. So in the end, late 70s until the mid 80s, there was really a big wave of autonomous um, radio stations, of pirate radio stations all over Europe. And I think this is also, especially Western Europe and also Eastern Europe. Um, there's a small example I forgot to tell you earlier because that's actually really nice. It was called the Black Channel. Der Schwarze Kanal, from 1986. And it was a collaborative radio show between Western and Eastern German um, anarchists. So they used texts that were speak spoken in the GDR in Eastern Berlin, um, and they brought them to West Berlin, and then they were putting, sending over the wall from West Berlin, but there was like, and interestingly enough, the two governments made the repression together. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, and this is like, there's like many small examples and bigger examples from squads, from occupations, from moments where people really just were transmitting life while being carried out of buildings and so on. Um, and that's why, <laughs> and out, <laughs> yeah, and out of this, basically, um, the free radio movement um, in the German speaking part of Europe kind of was formed. So as a follow up to all these pirate radios and up to date, there's of course still pirate radios and the radio still in moments of protest is a very interesting format, not only because you can transmit life out of a protest, but you can also use the radio as a protest tool itself by setting up stations where people can publicly listen to the radio and they can call in and then the station transmits music and brings people together and speaks about what is happening at this very moment at another part of the city, as we have, for example, also seen 2017 during the G20 protests in Hamburg. So, yeah, this is like a very short sum up of a general history of why radio is a very anarchic tool.
Thank you very much for this recap. Um, we've been now focusing on like uh, German and European history of radio and the possibility that it holds for our movements. Um, you've been also giving an amazing overview about how in Latin America a radio has been used from the population, like from working class, from people who were in revolt to canalize their struggles. Can you please tell us again why radio is such an important tool in the history of your realm? Yes, the communitarian radio, it's a very big tool in Latin America. Um, and as the comrades say, it also began in Latin America like uh, a little after in Europe, then in Europe uh, in the 30s. And it has been a very good tool to make a popular education between the population. Um, it has been used in different form of organizational process also, in political process. Uh, and it has been a lot of inspired of different parts of Latin America. I can, for example, tell, tell about uh, Paulo Freire, who is an edu uh, educational uh, uh, teacher from uh, Brazil, who also have this uh, discourse of uh, uh, make this popular education. And radio is a very big and good tool to, to make that, uh, where you can also have all this the colonial um, discourse. Um, I can think, for example, in Bolivia, it has been used to organize a protest against mining. It has been used in the under or against the dictatorship of Somoza in, uh, in Nicaragua. It has been used also in Salvador. Uh, Radio Venceremos is like the most uh, famous one, but there was another radio participating uh, in uh, that, using by the guerrilla. Um, the Zapatista, you may know, uh, have also uh, used this tool uh, with Radio Venceremos, no, Radio Insurgencia, sorry, um, and so on. There are a lot of uh, examples of how this have been a very good tool to coordinate and to also... Uh, like make easier because it's also a very rural place in, in Latin America so it's also easier to communicate with each other to find out what is happening in the other uh, territories uh, the local struggles um, and well I'm from Chile so I also want to share the experience uh, of the territory Yeah, it was already used like in uh, the, under the dictatorship uh, where It's very hard to get knowledge about what is happening. Uh, so there it was very important, Radio Moscú. Uh, but in the revolt, there was also, again, and it was in 2019, for those who maybe not know uh, about it, maybe it's impossible to not know now. But um, uh, there it was very interesting because uh, there was some days where there was uh, a lot of uh, boycott against uh, media, uh, organized media, so it was very important and in the internet, uh, Instagram, Facebook pages was uh, cutting down, so radio suddenly become very big because you could uh, take the vo voices from the, the street and put it uh, in the radio so you could find out what's what it was happening in different parts uh, of the territory of Chile, but also in the local situation. For example, if under a protest, where the cops was and what was going on, uh, because Latin America, as you may know, it have a lot of privatization of uh, medias. So uh, it also it is also a big fight because if you are not in the media, um, the only version of reality it's going to be from the powerful people uh, who, of course, didn't want us to organize and didn't want us to to know what was going on in the rest of the parts. And also to say, in Latin America, it's also a, um, like a popular and com uh, collective experience to listen to radio. Even if you don't like radio, you have to hear it when you take the buses. You have to hear it when you take whatever loco locomotion. Yeah. 
to to transport. Um, you listen it with the family. You listen it a lot. So we also think it have a very it can have a very revolutionary uh, action, and it. It's a big tool also, as the comrades say, uh, to hear what the neighbors also have to say. Um, so it was, yeah, it is also a big thing in Latin America. Thank you very much for this overview. So we just heard that on the one side, we can make radio part of revolutionary struggles that we engage with. Like it's a powerful tool for like organizing and helping to bring to life and bring to success like massive strikes and massive protests and like uh, big revolts, as we just heard, or anti-fascist organizing. And um, But it's also, as you just mentioned with the buses, it's also about listening. <laughs> so uh, we took a chance on like reflecting on the way that we all do media because we are most of us like anarchist radio producing people but we also tried to find out how we actually personally engage with alternative media and how we use that content that we draw from it to have some baseline for reflection on how to go on with our radio network. Who's willing to say some words about the discussion about personally personal engagement with alternative media? So I think it's an interesting question because uh, we normally don't think about that part of the equation. Um, we we started around, we asked uh, how people do actually do. Some people don't actually listen to radio, even though they do. Uh, but a lot of others did actually uh, listen to podcasts. Um, they used like methods of in their own groups, they have signal or telegram channels to distribute uh, ideas of what is a good information source or what podcast is nice or whatever, or what radio show uh, you should listen to. Um, so, and yeah, the second part uh, of the question is like, what do you do with this content? And this is, it was a more difficult question also because it's the question most people don't really want to think about maybe, or at least they don't do it. Um, so, um, but there were some, some interesting answers anyway, uh, because people said, yeah, First and foremost, it's inspiring. It's inspiring to, to read, uh, to listen uh, to this information from alternative sources. Um, it gives you ideas and maybe also motivation to do actions or replicate uh, things that, that are happening elsewhere. It uh, gives you a first uh, maybe basis for organizing yourself. Also in this round, some really nice things were said about like, how people like generally engage with the media. Also like one person said, for example, they really try to read or listen to one thing a day to stay in touch with alternative and self-organized media and information sources. Other people were like, I read it every day because I see it like as my privilege to also share it then with my other comrades and use it again in my own work. Um, and one uh, comrade said that for them, It's also not so much when, when they thought about how we engage with the content that it's for them not so much only about the content, but the empowering practice of radio is also really the making of the radio itself, like the whole technology around it, learning the technology um, together and getting to know more about this kind of stuff. Basically, I think you already said all the other things that we talked about. We also were like sharing a lot about what our, is our own concrete radio practice. So when we were talking about this question, we also came really into the talk about who does what actually to come to a picture, how, because it is not, really not I think it's not possible to talk about how do you personally engage with alternative media and how do you use the content you draw from it without first getting an insight into the person's um, practice so you can understand also what they take from it and how they engage with it. So this was also a big part of our talk, really like getting to understand the practice that each people have. And we all had very different practices. Some people um, are part of a regular podcast or a regular show. Others are just in a political group. And again, others have like this mobile um, radio station where they go to protests and then use some, uh, somebody else's live stream. So it was all very different. And that was also, for me, um, an important part of getting to understand the engagement. 
speaking of us producing radio shows, um, I mean, we sometimes try to have a specific effect with how we do it, because, I mean, we all made the decision to try and go for an anarchist approach to radio making. So we were wondering, what effect does our contact actually have Or what is it supposed to have? Like, what effect would we love for our content to have? Please share some thoughts on that. Hello, fellow comrades. So during our discussions in saint we talked with uh, a few of our comrades and uh, some of the effects that we see our radio having is uh, bringing alternative news uh, to people, as well as giving a voice to groups who don't usually have one. This could be maybe people who are affected by uh, climate catastrophes, for instance, in Hamburg uh, or uh, migrants uh, in uh, Chile or in other places uh, who don't uh, have a way to organize themselves. They can reach out to their uh, local radio anarchist stations and uh, have this information shared, uh, as well as... Uh, reflecting on what is being said in the mass media and uh, what of it is true and what is fake news and how does uh, this affect our communities. At the same time, uh, uh, what of, one of the effects that we wish to have is, to, is for people to reconsider their, their convictions and uh, maybe uh, spread the word and make... Uh, common agendas, for instance, uh, information about demonstrations, squat occupations or protests and others. And uh, to give uh, one example, uh, uh, an effect uh, that the live reporting has in demonstrations is uh, information sharing. For instance, uh, people can find out uh, where is uh, the place that you should not be going maybe, where are the cops uh, uh, amassing, where is uh, maybe uh, hitting people with uh, water cannons or uh, things like that. So staying informed uh, and uh, keeping uh, our comrades safe. And also one effect that sometimes is uh, present is uh, Maybe a negative one, uh, meaning uh, repression from cops, because uh, it's not just our comrades who listen to our radio. The, uh, the cops do too, and sometimes they can uh, confiscate the equipment or maybe even make arrests. So we have to be careful uh, for that. Ah, and uh, maybe one of the more important effects that uh, radio has in... Uh, For instance, for the student radios, there is a lot of uh, new people who get the chance to participate uh, in the anarchist radios. They get the information and then uh, they uh, take part, uh, they learn uh, new things uh, and uh, they are uh, able to help their communities. So reaching out from that question to a pretty similar one that we also discussed about was uh, what role does our media projects, our anarchist media projects, play in the revolutionary struggles that we share? And um, we come up with many different ideas about that. Uh, we had like a comrade from Brazil talk about how they really try to talk from an anarchist perspective about all the things you encounter in everyday life, like to just give a to give a narrative about the world and about yourself and the struggles that you face like from day to day how that um, um, has a how it plays into other forms of oppression and stuff like that and what's happening in the world and uh, set it into the specific frame that we use to understand the world as anarchists um, we saw a big potential in like us trying to connecting struggles all over the world by sharing news from the different movements and just report about what's going on elsewhere within our struggles and to just come to a place of being informed and staying connected and try supporting us and be in solidarity in all over the world um, And there was also people who invested a lot of time and energy in trying to engage in within the public debate, just like try and give um, counter information to what other mass media might say and to just like have more people uh, know the truth or have more people 
um, bring closer to our ideas or to also promote more people to actually share their own thoughts while like sharing our infrastructure. Collectivizing the infrastructure that we try to collect and build up is also a big thing of what we can do for our movements. Just provide um, mics, provide telephones, provide some knowledge about how to amplify one's own struggle. And... Um, also maybe serving for like the communication logistics as what mentioned many times before now like during revolts or even share knowledge about how to organize like this educational part that you also mentioned in the uh, talk about Chile and Latin America in the beginning was something that we loved like the idea of using ready to transport skills like just to do educational skill sharing also with the means of audio projects and um, be part of becoming try that we can try to become part of strategic debates because the world is giving us more and more challenges every day the world changes the ways uh, the way the ways the world oppresses us change and we need to also adapt our strategies against that to be able to free ourselves from it and this strategy st strategic debates need to happen somewhere and people talking to each other is can be a big part of that we also loved like the feminist approach that radio that you can do within your community for your community is a part of care it's part of care work you can give appreciation to comrades their struggle their work the risk that they face just the challenges that they face and the things that they're dealing with and that's a beautiful thing to do for each other and um, in general I think the most important thing that we do as anarchist media projects is amplifying uh, the things that we need to, to see growing in the world to achieve the world that we actually want to live in. So, so far for the role that we might be able to play when we play our part well, of course that's not all only easy, it doesn't come from nothing. So we also talked about what are the biggest challenges ahead of us as anarchist media and beyond that. Yes. I can say that we have a lot of challenges. <laughs> yes, we have it. And of course, it's not easy to be in a capitalistic world. Uh, and therefore, it's also very important to, to see uh, at the eyes of our challenges as uh, radios. And uh, yeah, what was uh, talking or what the topic was uh, about the challenges it started about uh, asking ourselves, Uh, how to build a, a good objective as a, a media because we had this discussion that in Latin America it was a little more like we want the objective is to achieve the most of the population we can and we also have or want to use it like a educational uh, tool because in Latin America the education is reserved for the people who has money uh, or the access to information. It's not so easy. Uh, so that was kind of our perspective but there was also another comrade that had this idea that they, they wanted to make radio uh, to the comrades uh, especially. So the first challenge is to know what we want to do. So we start with a clear objective. Um, another challenge that you also talked about before was uh, what do we do when you ha we have like a, a young people that they are very interested in uh, Instagram, TikTok, whatever, how to go outside this individual shoes of what you want to see and what you don't want to see. And uh, of course, it's a challenge because the radio is also brought in itself. You cannot say, oh, I don't want to listen to that song. It's part of uh, the program. So uh, it's also an exercise of, uh, yeah, maybe listen to some song you don't like or a part of you think, oh, no, it's maybe a kind of boring. Um, so that is a challenge. We don't have an answer, but there was some proposal. Some proposal was to make radio, radio outside with the neighbor, like an open radio. Uh, another form was... Uh, also uh, to make a creative program make program that you can enjoy that uh, not have to be like oh uh, a lot of theoretical uh, discussion 
Maybe if you want that, it's okay too. But it's also nicer to listen to radio that you also laugh uh, some while. And yeah. And also, we talked about uh, compromising and continuously uh, making program. If we uh, make program and are not uh, doing it uh, like, I don't know, in a, in a time and I don't know, every Thursday at 2 p.m., you know you will listen to this radio program. If that is kind of confusing, you also miss a lot of listening. So that was also uh, the proposal. Another challenge uh, was also to coordinate with other anarchist comrades that make other media uh, because, yeah, sometimes we have the information, we just have to make the way through. Um, there was also the despatriarchalization of the radio uh, and how yeah there was also this discussion of how to protect us uh, and some was saying well they protect uh, like to not be in danger uh, as a yeah, anarchist, it could be to be very close, but it could also be if you are very open. If all your community know about the radio and you do radio, your, yeah, your voice is um, not easy forgettable. So that was also a discussion in the, in the table. Yeah. So hello to everyone. Um, I am from Radio Kuruf. We are from Radio Kuruf with other comrades. So, uh, about the challenge, um, in my opinion, our, our radio, um, so I don't know if you know, but our radio making info and um, put info about the um, Mapuche struggle um, in, the, in the center and south of Chile. And, for example, uh, we are... Uh, already with the networks, uh, we make the info, uh, but maybe the challenge are um, put the antenna antennas antennas in in the lands because in the in in Chile in Latin America in, in, as well. Uh, the communities uh, of Mapuche or, or, or of all the and all the native uh, people uh, live in the lands mostly, and uh, the way to inform for these people is in radio, in FM or AM, because they, they don't have internet in the lands, you know. And so, for in my opinion, uh, maybe our next goal is. Uh, be in the in the waves, you know, because uh, the most farmer and indigenous people uh, only have the the radios to to keep informed, and because uh, I think we are finished with the first step, uh, uh, like uh, uh, be in the social medias and the. Uh, a radio station on our web page and, and stuff and we are already with connection in in all of the country for example we are a, our radio are a member of the red de medio de los pueblos and red de medio de Gualmapo and patagonia and also the red de los medios libres de america latina and this is this job is more um, technologically but it's already finished but the second maybe the most important is put our info in the lands in, in outside of the cities and this is our maybe or actually our currently goal we are work together with other companies from Argentina to make trans transmissor trans what transmissores Transmitter. transmitters and we, uh, some companies of our project are learning about uh, how to make this stuff and put in the, put in the, in the lands. 
Thank you very much. That's an important like, technical step to react to the challenges ahead of us and already a concrete concept for further developing our media approach. There's also been another group which discussed more broadly about strategies or concrete concepts for further developing. Do you want to share additional things that were on your mind? Uh, yeah, as the history uh, shows for what we speak Uh, actually before for the history you can see that actually the strategies was already made in the history so it's nothing new we can discover only uh, the, the the biggest critic is now the media is very big uh, outside of from our movement uh, Twitter and uh, YouTube and everything uh, around us we still think that uh, we through this process we were still thinking that uh, it's very important uh, to focus on life not live stream uh, protest, which is usually now, but like how to make these uh, moments when something happens that in that time the radio is on, actually. And how still to be present every day. Not every day, but uh, when you do the shows regularly. Um, this is very, uh, so it's very hard to do the radio 24 hours, seven days. But uh, maybe this is what we don't want to do. This was something uh, which we all agree in. Uh, and I think also the concrete con concept, uh, how to go, uh, was more on focusing on when the struggle is happening uh, and also in quietness, when it's not happening, how to still develop the education and so on. Uh, so it was a lot of said before, but maybe I can uh, uh, put three stories which we uh, put out. Uh, one is about, uh, let's say, migration 2015, uh, when it was happening. Uh, most of the media, they couldn't reach the, the, the uh, migrants. Uh, let's say in Slovenia, was, they need to be away from a uh, migrants camp 200 meters. So actually the state manipulates the media, so you cannot get the real information. So it was important to infiltrate and do the video in that sense, and also to make a report for the radio, let's say, to how to go in. So also this legal, uh, unlegal, it's very important that we, because the legal... Pff, Media, mainstream media does, so this is not our role, actually. So we need to cover those who are not covered uh, in, the, in the voice. So from this uh, perspective, Voices of Anarchy could be the, the tool that, uh, like this, also this network, also the history, uh, it could be a tool of governments, it could be a tool of, uh, of um, uh, movements, Uh, activist movements, and it was always important, the information. So the strategies, actually, we know it for the history, but this concrete are more like how to go to these zones, uh, and these strategies are sometimes very hard, uh, how to, you know, to get all the information from the police case <laughs> against uh, prisoners, or the court, ca court case, because usually you get it when it's done. <laughs> You know, uh, it's very hard. Uh, so maybe this is, we, we didn't have answers. Uh, this is a very hard topic, I would say. But it's some tools in the history which they were used, you know. Infiltration, for sure, it's one. Uh, how to get information which no one can get. Um, and also uh, bringing uh, one concrete, let's say. Uh, it's bringing the radio to the, uh, our communities. So it's not like we are far and calling, but also to do it live from the places we live in or do, do, doing in, and maybe find also voices which are not the part of the radio, <laughs> and to facilitate, to engage more uh, people that they can come in and uh, have the voice. Uh, even they, they do mistakes, like I do now, probably, and so on. It's not this, it's more um, how to catch the moments. Uh, and so on. And also, um, anyway, we will cut if I... Uh, yeah, I think also the, the, the construct, how to do constructs as media, as media as we are, it's very important to rethink before, I think we all do it, uh, because uh, if we do overwhelm media, <laughs> is the biggest problem that people are... You are repeating yourself. This is one uh, thing we all... that. 
if you uh, do the, um, the reflection of one year of radio shows, you can see and, uh, the repeatings, which is logic. Its life is repeating uh, uh, generally. But how to find also the, the liveness which, is, which changes. <laughs> so this is also because I think uh, most effective... Uh, is this that what is life actually? What uh, when it's a moment that happens when it's awake people to go on the street to to uh, write things and so on. So otherwise, uh, I think the history can uh, show us a lot. Uh, I think uh, uh, about comrades, we all reflect, and so we, we were not so smart about to do, let's say, one strategy. This one will be the best. I think it's no one, but it's many. Uh, so that's it. Thank you. So we are now as anarchist anti-authoritarian network, radio network people facing like all the challenge of trying to draw some conclusions from what we have been discussing here and also from what we all learned from the amazing projects that other comrades do. Is there specific things that you would like to take into account and draw something further from it for your engagement in the network or in your local radios? I think uh, when... When we start this network, uh, I mean, it, it was coming from uh, the idea that we need, you know, because reporting just from local, it's, uh, <laughs> it's very hard to be, uh, yeah, to have um, a lot of media all the time or to, have, to speak about it. It's very hard. Yeah, enough contact. So I think uh, these networks, it's very important. Uh, and I think we are in this process as a movement not just uh, uh, bad news, but also the other radios are doing this. And I think it's very important to develop this network, which comes from the street, from the, our local communities, and to send it to Slovenia, let's say, to Ljubljana. That I hear what is happening in Chile from the street, from the people who are living there, not from the journalist point of view, <laughs> which is always... Uh, a little bit anthropology or a little bit um, faked or they, you know, they, it's much more life and much more. So I think uh, approaches are already here. The tools are here. We know how to use it. And I think it's more uh, doing it more in the sense of networking, have more comrades and so on. Yes. For example, for us, it's very important um, are connected with other comrades uh, from Europe, from USA, because uh, I told you uh, before about our connection in Latin America, but um, it's important uh, for us to uh, uh, be connected by the... Uh, share the what really happened in Gualmapu in the Mapuche zone uh, to the world. Um, uh, maybe we are a little busy, a little lazy with the bad news report, but we we retake the the work in this year. But for example, these gatherings in in Bab in, in in the book fair in Ljubljana and. And here in San Imir is, 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 is are historical for us to share, to know uh, another projects, make uh, new comrades, new networks, new connection is, is important for us. Just shortly because you mentioned bad news before, that's a, a monthly show that we all put together as Anarchist and Anti-Authoritarian Radio Network. You can find it on our website. A-radio-network.org It's publicly, it's uh, published monthly and it has like English-speaking content from all over the world that we produce in our local radios. Uh, one thing that I have found really inspiring to be here and I would love to to also do it, but I, know, I don't know if we are skilled enough, but um, I've been talking a lot with the comrades from Radio Kuruf about how, uh, how they already managed, how, or how you already managed to become of such an important service for like the struggling comrades from the Mapuche community that you're actually an infrastructure that pe people are really happy to use and are really relying on and it's 
and it's become an important tool for the movement itself to like reach you reach out for you and share stuff with you and be like hey can you please share this and like you said that like many many messages reach you every day with like please can you share it because it's important for us that it's shared and I think doing like years of all this crazy work and effort that it takes to play such a vital role that people um, so in the moment people don't think anymore about mm, what could we possibly like send this month but like it's a, there's already a very alive and very strong uh, very resilient movement which has found radio as a tool to amplify what's going on and to feel like more safe and to be feel, feel more able to survive also the depression that's coming I think that's very beautiful and you also mentioned that you're doing a great job with like reaching also imprisoned comrades from the Mapuche struggle because the connection Connection is already there, and then you just keep it going and keep it alive by trying to send voices from outside inside and voices from inside outside. And this is something like I would love if we were able to kind of reproduce that at one day, maybe in eight years. Um, in, for example, I live in Germany, in Germany as well, to to have been building this connection in the struggle, and then just making radio a very organical part that fits very well into a distance which is going on. I'm uh, very amazed by what you told me and I hope we can try and become as as anarchist <laughs> as well in the future of our struggle. Uh, it's really, it strikes me really interesting to things that you say. Are you really thinking about what you could broadcast every month? Do you think there's not enough things happening to broadcast about? Don't comrades contact you and tell you things they are doing? Because I have like this... I don't know, I have a show every week and it's always too full and I'm like, shit, I have to propone, postpone things to next week. So I'm, I was like a bit uh, shaken by like, come on, that can't be true that you don't have enough things to broadcast about. The movement is indeed very lively. I don't mean it quantity-wise. I mean it more in a, in a question of that it's like uh, strategically organized and that's like going in the direction of a concrete struggle because I mean I can like share an example like the last time we actually sat down in our local radio group and we're like okay how can we as a radio contribute to what we as anarchists try to do in the world was like when the inflation was hitting very hard in the last months a little years Uh, like we were like, okay, so what's actually like, okay, many, many more people are going to be suffering much more from poverty, you know, and like, like capitalism is going to go one more time really crazy on everyone. And um, how can we kind of try and uh, try and be part of pushing like a strong working class anarchist resistance into um, existing and being more lively. And I think it's a, And I think these are two different perspectives to take on specific struggles. I mean, of course, there's like so much going on and it's uh, there's all the time something where it's like, oh, that's like so important or that's so crazy that really needs to be spread more, wi more um, widely. But um, I think we sometimes also still face the situation that we are trying on how can we be part of the start of something which is going to be very powerful and able to actually collectively react to the collective challenges and the big issues, <laughs> so to say, that we have, which is, I think, a slightly another level of like, okay, so this is an initiative there and this is something really important, like a um, piece of repression over there that we want to support the affected people from or stuff like this. And, uh, and I think this is something which I'm really looking forward to if we have like... Uh, the combined strength of a revolutionary movement and like this little piece of part that we can play in it and the little piece of service that we can do as radio to just like organically <laughs> 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 I don't know the word. It's, it's sound effects <laughs> yeah. No, I think as, as my comrade was saying, there's indeed, of course, no lack of uh, possible information and topics. And indeed, we are being contacted by projects that say, okay, in two months we want to do that camp. Uh, could you please uh, advertise it or maybe do an interview with us and stuff? Of course, that happens regularly. Um, but it's still not uh, like that, that... Um, things that happen in the movement and mm, like new projects and so that it becomes like a very 
logical step to simply say, okay, let's talk to the some anarchist radio project. Let's put it out there. No, it's not yet there. I have another question. Is that right? Which interests me a lot, and I would uh, love if, uh, to know if you have already some idea or some experiences with that, because we had it as a question in our discussion group about the role that we could play, because we talked a lot, also just now again, about how we can be of service to our communities and our struggles, and how can we strengthen our movements. But we were also thinking about the the other side of the coin: how can we weaken our enemies? Like, how can we make the systems that we are trying to find? How can fight? How can we be annoying to these systems? How can we play a part of weakening the oppressive structures? Or how can we be a, um, how can we as radio activists um, piss off people that are responsible for things that we hate? Do you have any experience with that on how to not strengthen ourselves but weaken the opponent? as radio people. I don't know if I will answer that, but uh, because it's uh, usually the, um, they don't listen our radios, except the uh, police maybe. But <laughs> I would say, uh, but they're not disturbed, they just watch yeah, or listen. But I would say that uh, it's hard to do spectacle on the radio. If it's nothing happening, I think sometimes, okay, we have a problem in our show and we do just music. And we comment music and I think also the culture point of view shows some, you know, edu um, uh, produce some thinking also for the people. And so sometimes uh, it doesn't happen often, maybe in these 10 years, five times that we did the music, we... Uh, We say who, who is the band, what, from where they are and what they do. But politically, but this is just when it's a crisis. But how to, uh, let's say for me, uh, the best radio shows were when something was happening on the street or uh, when something was happening in the community which was disturbed with the uh, municipality, let's say. Uh, and I think that was... Uh, It's hard to do it on the radio, I would say. You could provoke it maybe in mainstream media, but you will not be there probably. But uh, as our radio, it's hard this uh, how to, to approach this that you would uh, you would disturb the 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 um, governments or the people who are uh, the politics or the capitalists or whatever. But I think it's more important that also when it's a gap, it's a gap. You don't have nothing to say. Okay, we will find something new. Sometimes this happens. But sometimes uh, overloading, producing, it's also questionable because you're just speaking and speaking and speaking. Um, but uh, it depends also how much connections you have. I think this is also, I think for our, our radio show, this network or this uh, in external uh, movements which are not the part of our movement helps us very a lot. So, yeah. I don't know if to me there is a big difference between building up our movement and destroying the enemy because I see myself primarily as an anarchist and out of an anarchist position I am an anti-fascist for example so I have my focus on building an anarchic world and through building it, of course, some things have to be destroyed or are destroyed, but not that's not where my focus is on. Like, of course, I don't want fascism to spread, but I feel like by putting the focus on what we are building up is the most annoying thing. For me, the existence of me as a transmasculine radio maker that does a show at 7 a.m. when people go to work and talks about anarchism and sex and all the things that people don't really want to listen to, but in actually, I, I think they do. <laughs> I think that is for me already a big emancipatory um, point and also probably annoying enough to many people that they just turn off the radio. One quick thing I just re remembered about from our discussion group because you just already mentioned anti-fascism quickly. There was one example of one comrade said 
that they would, um, and I like that very much, actually call like from the radio infrastructure, like known fascists or like parents of fascists in the village and in the surrounding area, just being like, yeah, we know about you. We don't like what you do. And I think this like vague feeling of fear to be able to spread that <laughs> into people that are really doing very harmful things and um, um, being part of like trying to uphold a world which is really dangerous to most of us. I think that's a good thing what we can do. Also just to give this vague feeling of like, we're watching you. <laughs> I love that. Okay, I personally think that the most disruptive thing that uh, Anarchist Radio does is disrupt the narrative. Disrupt narratives of the state, disrupt narratives of capitalism of uh, patriarchy by introducing other things like uh, when there's absolutely no information let's say about the process in Rojava then having an anarchist interview about this topic is a very important thing because people will then have an, another view of point that disrupts the normality and uh, the other example would be um, really using uh, radio as a live station tool on sites where you can engage with local populations and this already might lead to some self-organization to some disrupting of the normal uh, way of dealings in the neighborhood uh, this is also a very disruptive way which of course at the same time is a very constructive thing there's a duality of this uh, radio making that we all are aware of yeah in in uh in my point of view, um, the main contribution of our radio is uh, share the real info about the Mapuche struggle because the mass media uh, just uh, make a like a, a I don't know a, like a terrorist uh, image about the Mapuche struggles and don't. Uh, report about the political prisoners for example and uh, for example the, the 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 main tool of the mapuche political prisoners are the hunger strike uh, these people uh, make a lot uh, in one year three or four and uh, very long hunger strike like a uh, 100 days uh, without food is is very tough uh, But the mass media don't cover the hunger strikes, for example, or what real happened with when the police uh, come to the communities to uh, to how you say shoot yeah kill and shoot the 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 Mapuche children also is very is very hard. But the mass media don't cover. We try to be the, the voice of the of the communities and this is our our main goal for the for the for the for I don't know for make radio make uh, not only radio we also uh, make videos and other uh, documents in, in paper you know all the medias all means necessary. I think uh, another very important uh, difference between like mass media and our own DIY anarchist media is what you just said, like what we cover, what we don't cover, like what, what is censored and what is not and what we try to bring to life. But also I feel like generally like uh, oppressors have the general feeling that the majority of the society is on their side. Like for me often, I feel like if I intervene in an oppressive situation, like everyone's kind of surprised because people usually feel like, okay, I'm allowed to be oppressive because this is how the world works and everyone's kind of going to be accepting that. And that's what I really love also as a potential that we have as anarchist media, that we can be this surprise to like oppressive systems or oppressive people that we're not on their side. And especially if we kind of, like you also said, what you do on your show with Radio Kuruf to, to keep an appearance. I mean, it's not saying we don't, I'm not saying we have to, but it's one, two that we can choose. Like if we try and keep an appearance of like how we talk and how we dress or whatever is like this classic, I don't know, journalism, media people, then it can be really uh, amazing to see how um, 
how, for example, I don't know, one uh, example that I just thought about is uh, we had like these wild strikes of uh, migrant workers in Berlin in the last years quite often. And I, for example, also tried like for our radio to go there and talk to the workers that were on strike. But I also tried to talk to the manager who was on site. And I was like uh, saying like, hi, I'm from a radio. I'm from a radio. I didn't say which one. I'm just saying, hey, I'm from radio. Um, what's going on here? Why are you here? Like, why don't you give these people da da da? And he like really started to be like, yeah, you know, like we're in Germany and law and order and the company and the safety of producing, blah, 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 blah. And then I was like asking questions or like telling him stuff where like, well, we think it's wrong and why don't you give them just like the wage that they deserve or why don't you give them the gear that they need? And he got like super angry because he was really not expecting the fact like someone would actually be on the worker side coming like from the outside of society, like from this... Uh, pseudo journalist perspective and that got me thinking because I was like maybe you can actually also have an effect when you like disguise as this classic like journalist person but then are in strong solidarity with the what we say with the dis disruptive elements of the, <laughs> of the current system and I would like to I don't know carve out this path and find more out about the power that maybe could lie there or maybe not I think what you just said also brings me back to what the comrade earlier has just said, namely the point of um, positionality, and that I think this is the big strength. No, that's why it's an anarchist radio network. So we also always can only talk from this subjective and also very political point of view, and it transports into everything we say and in the way we do a show and an interview, not only into content itself, which I think is also something that I've been thinking a lot about in these past days. So I think we are kind of like close to covering it all up. Is there anything more that you think is very important to take away from this gathering that we're having in saint Jimier as anarchists and anti-authoritarian radio network? Is there something which is important you, to you? So you want to share it before we close this? Yes. <laughs> we, will, we will make a presentation about our documentary uh, by Radio Kuruf from the oh, about the Chilean revolt in 2018. So, uh, see you in Saturday at 8 p.m. in the cinema near to the church. Okay, I think that uh, it was really a great opportunity to meeting new comrades, new projects. Uh, we met a lot. Uh, actually, I was surprised how many there were. Um, at the presentation, there were 70 people and more or less. At least 55 were actually participating in some anarchist media project. Uh, that was amazing. And I'm really curious to see how this goes forward. So like one last shout out. If you are listening to this and you're doing somehow anarchist media, maybe especially anarchist audio <laughs> based media, feel free to contact us. And if you want to be part of our network, just say hi. You can find all the contact information like our email address and everything on our website. A-radio-network.org But we don't have a specific email for the network so feel free to contact any participating project or contact us via our Mastodon contact uh, which is a-radio-network at collectiva.social This is The Final Straw Radio. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at TFSR, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books. Located at 1022 Haywood Road in West Asheville, Firestorm Books is a worker-owned cooperative in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines plus a full calendar of events at their website, firestorm.coop.